you see here is the cathedral of Lin Shaping. It's a stunning tool in the city center, reminding everyone of the uh, Catholic history we have here in Sweden. But I'm going to explore a hidden treasure that, that we can find behind it, and it's the castle of Lin Shaping. This house has been a home for, for bishops, dukes, and kings ever since the first building was built in the 12th century. So, welcome to Linköping's Castle and Cathedral Museum. Uh, we're now standing in the inner courtyard, and in the north wing, uh, there is a museum that was founded 20 years ago, and it's opened 20th of March, the year 2000. And it's a wonderful little museum telling all about this magnificent castle, the history of the castle. And it's also showing beautiful objects from the church. Uh, so it's quite unique, you see. The oldest part of the castle of Linköping is in the west wing, where we actually have a well from the Middle Ages that's still pouring out the most clear and well uh, tasted water. It's fantastic. But now we're standing in a defense tower that was built during the late uh, 13th century. And it was stood um, in five floors, 1286. And it was founded by the Bishop Bent, who was the son of Birger Jarl. And uh, Bent and his older brother, the king, Magnus I, Magnus Law, the laws in Swedish, they uh, founded a uh, Franciscan monster in the center of Linköping. And it was founded the, late of, the year after, 1287. So that's when one can say that the city of Linköping actually was founded. And if you want to make the acquaintance with the first bishop who actually lived here in Linköping, you can find him here on the screen. This is the Bishop Gisle. And there was an important church meeting here, 1153. And for his guest, he built it. A residence like this, two floors high, with a little cellar. Uh, where he kept the wine and the food. And uh, you can also have some little info points where you can read more about this little residence. And um, the residence was then extended during the Bishop Bain's period. And here you can see the, the defense tower and we're now standing in the bottom of the tower. And new for this time is to build important buildings in bricks. And that was um, transported and the knowledge of building with bricks was, was uh, uh, transported to Sweden and to Scandinavia by the monks in the monasteries. So you can see that the old bishop's residence was extended in brick. And here you can find the, the defense tower and the wall against the church also. And this was only the entrance for the bishop. The other ones had to go on the other entrance here. So we have left the defense tower and we're walking up the stairs to the third floor. And what we're about to see which I'm really excited about, is the Great Hall of Duke Charles, who later became the King of Sweden, Carl the Ninth. And this is where he held his big dinner parties and invited all his guests during the early 17th century. And now we're standing here 400 years later, and I'm wondering, what was the purpose of incorporating new technology into this room today? We wanted to tell the, the exciting and, and important story of this castle and therefore we borrowed old paintings from the National Gallery in Sweden and to show which king have actually lived here and, and uh, extended the castle. Uh, 
And uh, when Gustav Vasa came to power in Sweden in 1523, he uh, had a big loan to Lübeck to pay back. Uh, and uh, he didn't know where to find the money, but he had heard about Martin Luther. And therefore he suggested at the parliamentary session in Westeros, 1527, that Sweden should be Protestant instead of Catholics. And uh, the bishop, the, the latest Catholic bishop who lived here was Hans Brask. And after this parliamentary session, he fled the country. And uh, Gustav Vasa just took over all the land, all the farms that the bishop owned, and uh, of course also the castle of Linköping. So he moved inside and started a transformation from the um, old bishop's residence to a royal palace, a real Renaissance palace. So here you can see the palace of Gustav Vasa. And in the late 15th century, uh, the prior bishop, uh, Henry Tidemansson, he had built up those defense walls around uh, the castle so that you got them in a courtyard here. Continuously, his both son continued to extend the castle and uh, Here's how the castle looked 1604 when everything was ready. So Johan III, he built it up so it was three floors high, but only the south wing and the west wing. And 1604 it was accomplished by uh, Duke Charles, who later became King Carl IX. And in the south wing, there was a great parliamentary hall, a big parliamentary hall. And um, uh, Johan had married a Catholic princess who became the Queen of Sweden, Katarina Hagelonica, and their son was raised to be Catholic, and he was named Sigismund. And uh, Sigismund was king both in Poland and in Sweden, and um, when he was in Poland, uh, Duke Charles uh, was the one to lead the parliamentary session and he gained more and more power and so therefore um, Sigismund took a big fleet and a lot of his army to actually try to take away the power from his uncle and there was a big battle here in Linköping, the Battle of Stångebro in the center of Linköping and Sigismund failed and lost so um, Duke Charles said, I'm the king, and uh, Sigismund fled. And uh, that's why we are still Protestants here in Sweden today. Sigis uh, um, Duke Charles, King Carl IX, he imprisoned all the noblemen that had fought for Sigismund. And they were kept during uh, a big parliamentary session here in Linköping at the year 1600. And they were imprisoned here inside the castle. And uh, later on, there were five persons executed on the square Stora Trojet in the center of Linköping. And it's all known to the history at the bloodbath of Linköping. And in the late 18th century, uh, the county governor, Friedrich Leo Strömfeldt, who lived outside in the other courtyard, he wanted to move inside. And he raised a big funding and uh, actually built a beautiful residence inside the castle that is still used by the present county governor. And uh, he didn't want this old building to look like a fortress, like a Renaissance castle. He wanted it to look like a 18th century residence. So he took away all the, the gables, all the, the um, 
the entrance from the south wing. He wanted it all plain, all the privies, all the old toilets for the bishops were taken away, uh, the other stairs were taken away. So everything was, the, 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 the windows was placed in rows to get the closet to look higher. But at the year 700, there was a big fire inside the city of Linköping. And uh, the town hall was burnt down among uh, 150 other uh, estates. And uh, in the town hall, there was the prison cells. So the, they moved the prisoners inside the castle. So it's, it has not only been noblemen and kings and, and, and bishops who have lived here, it's also been thieves and other bad persons living inside, it was imprisoned here inside the castle. And uh, when the county governor moves inside and had his beautiful residence here, he didn't want to see the imprisoned people. So therefore they built up a wall inside in the courtyard so that they can exercise on the one side and that the county governor can use the other side. And in the late 19th century, uh, the, for the time being, the fashion was that everything should look as old as possible. So all the old Vasa residences uh, was trying to make it look older. And uh, they didn't know exactly how the gables was put on during the Renaissance period, but they tried to make it look the same and fashionable. So they put on new gables and uh, put on a new spear on the town, on the entrance, the stair entrance to the castle. And um, this is made by Robert Lagardi. And here you can see also a gable for the entrance on the south wing. And 1930s, the castle was restored once again. And uh, this is how it looks today. Uh, so it's all been filmed. And uh, you can see the entrance from the south wing. And you can also see the castle today, how it looks today. And this little spot shows where we are standing right now in the museum of Linköping's Cathedral, Cathedral Museum. And on the back you can see um, where the county governor's has his dining room and also where the Duchess, the Princess Estelle's, uh, has her own saloon. Um, the inhabitants of Linköping and all through Sweden don't know the, the, the long and, and important history of this castle. So thanks to Vesman Vänerska Foundation who have sponsored us and make this possible, this project possible. And for me working here, uh, it's, it's wonderful to, to, to use this tool to present the, the story of the castle. It's, it's, you get everyone uh, involved and uh, the, the classes from the school and, and um, other groups that are visiting us. It's, it's a wonderful tool to tell the story of the castle. And uh, this is for me when I do the guiding and as, also as well when you come here on your own, you can explore and you can find more and learn more about the, the castle on your own. So it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful tool for us. Did you learn anything new? Yes, we learned a lot uh, during this, this um, uh, digitalization of the, the history of the castle. And I must say, uh, Eva Modian, who have worked as an um, archaeologist here and did the archaeological excavation uh, in the late 1990s, she has been done a tremendous job, job and, and explained where the windows were seated and where the castle was extended. She, she, she was marvelous in this job, actually. 
And she knew all the things. She knew where the stones have been seated, where the walls have been seated. And my job was to find the, the, the paintings, to, to, to get inhabitants inside the castle, to, to, um, to tell the, the, the story of the people who have lived here and all the, th the, the, the things that happened here. So it's, be, it's been quite a good match, actually. And then we had a, um, a good person working at Interspectral who understood us and could, and could uh, explain how to, it's need to be done and what, what we could present here. So it's, it's been a really good job. Yeah, it's really impressive how that many stories can be held within the walls of just one building. Uh, but I know that's not the only thing you have to show here. Uh, so we're now entering a treasure chamber. Tell us more about that. In this treasure chamber, there are a lot of, of uh, unique items. And we also have, of course, a lot of gold and silver from the cathedral. But the most valuable things in here are medieval textiles, needleworks from the nuns in Rusty. And uh, in front of the altar inside the church, this is the cloth, the, the, the frame in front of the altar, and it's all been embroidered by the nuns in the late. 15th century. So, uh, 1515, the bishop's bones were dug up from his grave and was put in beautiful boxes and worships inside a cathedral. And often the, the, the boxes were made of gold and silver, but it's quite unique because the nuns in Boston are made of five reliquaries, uh, like, like um, a glass, like a, a, a chalice with lid, and uh, only four remains to this day, and three is, uh, uh, is are shown at the Historical Museum in Stockholm, and here in Linköping's Castle and Cathedral Museum, we are shown one, and it's quite a unique piece, and you can see it over here. It's all started uh, in the year 2017, when we received a gift from the Historical Museum, the National Historical Museum in Stockholm, and it was this little note, this little paper note here, and uh, on the paper note, you can um, read forms that was donated to the monastery of Vastiana. And it's all been written out from a book where they kept all the names of the farms. And the latest book uh, with all the don donated farms is from 1466. And this little note was put in between the beautiful embroidery and the wooden uh, box. So um, one believed that the nuns uh, teared out the, the papers and used them uh, uh, when they embroidered uh, the reliquary to, to get some support when they put it up all the beautiful um, stones and the, the fresh water pearls and the enamels. So this is how the, the reliquary looks today. And um, as we digitized this, uh, two professors from the University of Uppsala visited us and brought with them their microscope and uh, found out quite new uh, things that we haven't known before. So, um, this is the digitized for this beautiful relic query. And first, we'll tell um, a little about relics and saints. And uh, so, we have two saints, and here's the one, most famous one um, uh, Santa Brigida, 
the Holy Bridge, Bridge of Sweden. And here you can explore this red quarry. And um, you can turn it upside down, you can see in the bottom. You can see the old market in here. Oops, Linköping it says. Uh, and it's all due to the bishop Nicolaus Hermani. Uh, and the skull of the bishops were kept inside this reliquary. And um, it's the entire box. But when you look at the lid, the professors thought, well, if you look at the lid, you can see actually it's, it's, it's a ribbon that's been red from the beginning. And it's only covered in silver plates. You can see one is, a little piece is still left here. Um, in the late 18th century, uh, they extended the, the church and built up a new tower on the church and they needed money, funding. So they just robbed all the medieval things uh, and to pay for the extension of the church. But here they missed a little a piece of the silver plate here. And uh, when they looked in the microscope, they can see that it's been golden shine and it looked like a crown. And they also found out that it's been put um, rubies in every of this corner and probably one big ruby on the top to be able to lift the lid. And um, from that one believe that someone's skull that's been connected to the nunnery of Mastina, that it was made actually for someone else, not the bishop here. So it's written all new history and one believe that it's the Saint Catherine, Saint Catherine of Vastiana, the daughter of Saint Bridget of Sweden. And here you can see how thick the wooden box is actually uh, in the middle and how the embroidered are just kept round. And uh, we've made quite a job trying to figure out how this magnificent piece, this reliquary, looked from the beginning. And as you can see, that they've taken away all the stones, all the pearls, all the nails. But look here. This is how one believed that it must have looked like from the beginning. And there are rubies, there are aquamarines, there are freshwater pearls, the emeralds. It's wonderful. And you also have pendants hanging around here, and you can see the gold and silver plates. And from the meter, the, the headpiece of the bishop, they were enables, and they have exactly the same size as on this reliquary and uh, the meter is from the middle of the 15th century so we put them in there because the, the professors thought that this is how it looked and here one can see the crown from the nuns in the monastery and you can see the resemblance of the lid so Saint Catherine uh, she was also beatified, and uh, her skull was laid in this uh, reliquary, 1489. The uh, funding for this uh, was uh, comes from from um, uh, the professor B. Rinspers uh, Stifters uh, donation. Fund. So this is also a wonderful tool and, and get people to appreciate and get interested in this unique object that we're very proud to actually be able to show here.
now we see.